Hey, what's up guys? So this is gonna be a bonus video kind of revolving around some things about the HU1, some things that I didn't get to in the review. Uh, this is gonna cover a, a few different topics. There's not really gonna be any specific structures. So I'm just gonna kind of jump into it and talk about everything that's going on in my brain about the HU1 from Sennheiser. So the first thing was kind of how all of this actually happened. Uh, this is one of those scenarios where people say it doesn't hurt to ask and that it was exactly what happened. Daniela, who's a rep for Sennheiser, reached out for the HD 560S review. And I literally just asked her if there was a, like an HE1 at a showroom anywhere, basically nearby in Washington state. And she originally hit me up about, there's one in the showroom in uh, San Francisco, which is actually for Sennheiser. And then uh, a couple days later, she actually got back to me about definitive audio in Bellevue, uh, which is like 40 minutes away from me. So super close. And then I worked with uh, Tom and Zach and Daniela at Definitive Audio to shut down like a four hour slot for me to listen to it and film with it and do my review with it. And that was extraordinarily cool. And I could not have asked for a, a better scenario really. So for me, the expectation going into this was uh, kind of high to be honest. Like, you know, it's a $60,000 headphone or headphone system. Um, so, you know, you'd want it to be very, very good. Now, I think it's also fair to say that, you know, for $60,000, the, any set of expectations is probably reasonable to have. And that may be true, but some of the expectations I was expecting, like I talked about in the review was like just ridiculous amounts of detail. Um, and this headphone, it, it never really gave me the sense of being a super detail oriented headphone. Um, like the AB1266 was a really detail-oriented headphone. It uh, was super quick, super fast, a combination of the driver physical capability and the frequency response and the tuning. And all that came together to provide a headphone that when you hear it, one of the standout features is detail. And one of the surprising things to me was that wasn't the purpose of the A21. Now, this isn't to say it's a bad thing at all. But uh, one of the things that I kept repeating in my review was that this is more of a kind of a naturalistic sound signature. And I think that's true. Uh, but this is just different than my expectations were for this headphone. Now, the reason why I just wanted to mention this was because, you know, if you are, if you happen to be in the actual market for one of these things, it, it's going to be good to know sort of the sound signature that you're going to be getting. And that was the big purpose for the review was like, there's no shows, there's you know, no public events that are doing a lot of showcases. A lot of the hi-fi stores are not actually doing uh, demos for headphones because of COVID. So one of the selling points for from me to Sennheiser was like, hey, you can't do shows right now. So, you know, at least let's broadcast it to some people and perhaps get some people potentially interested in actually buying an HU1. Uh, and if anything, it just starts for, you know, good advertisement for Sennheiser. Part of what I wanted to talk about was the ordering process and uh, kind of how that all works. So this is a little bit like a high-end car, a little bit. There's some parallels there. Uh, the first thing that you do is you go on their website and you make a $10,000 down payment. So you, you just pay it. Um, I believe if you cancel the order, you get that back. I don't think that they're, they're gonna take that, but then they have uh, contact info that you fill out and Sennheiser will contact you and take the rest of the payment over the phone, the, the remaining $50,000. Uh, balance. Then on that phone call, uh, they'll run over all of your options so you can pick specific marble. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, although I don't know this for a fact, but I wouldn't even be surprised if they could use a material that's not marble, but uh, I think you can pick your own marble for sure. Uh, and then the brass knobs are anodized in a metal that you can change the color of. They didn't say this, but I'm pretty sure this is one of those products where you could probably change just about anything if you gave Sennheiser enough money. <laughs> um, that's kind of similar to how the high-end world works with cars where, you know, there's the changes that are standard and then there's the, well, how much do you want to spend to get this? And we'll work with you on that. I'm just assuming that, so I don't have any information to, to back that claim up. Then after you purchase it, you give them the options that you want, they will build your HU1 and then they'll deliver it in this big wooden crate. And I think they send a Sennheiser rep out to kind of walk you through the setup process. The setup process is actually pretty simple. You plug it in and you turn it on, you input your source just like every other DAC. And there you go, <laughs> that's it. Um, you can use this thing as just a DAC if you want to. So it does have 
XLR and RCA outputs out the back. Um, so if you plug in, you know, USB or optical or, you know, whatever you are using, you can output the DAC signal if you want to a pair of speakers or another pair of headphones. Um, and in a lot of ways, this is a, it's kind of, you got this halo effect around it, but it's actually a pretty simple device. There's not really anything about this that is very complicated to use. It's pretty much just, you know, a standard uh, headphone system, essentially. Now, speaking of headphone systems, um, funnily enough, as crazy as this sounds, within the realm of like really, really high-end, extremely high-priced products, uh, this is actually not the most expensive system that you can buy. There are headphone amps and DACs that are like hundreds of thousands of dollars each. Um, although usually outside of jewelry headphones, the most expensive headphone headphone that's like dedicated that you can buy, I think it's about $6,000. Um, and I think that'd be for like one of the, some of the abyss stuff. Uh, this as far as 6,000. I think there's some custom headphones that are made by like real small manufacturers in Japan that cost more. Um, but I'm usually pretty skeptical of those because <laughs> they're, they're not established. So, you know, it's hard to tell what kind of reliability you're going to be getting, what kind of product consistency you're going to be getting, and then things that are, are just a straight up scam. So anyways, so what you're paying for here is a mixture of a few different things. There's the physical uh, build of it, which is expensive. It's not cheap to build something of that high caliber uh, machining materials. I'm sure the drivers that they use in there are extraordinarily hard to produce. Um, the DAC setup with the eight individual DACs and all the fancy tubes and the amount of tubes that they have to run through before they find tubes that are exactly, you know, precisely what they want as a company. The quartz, uh, the marble, all of that stuff. All of that stuff does get factored into the, the build material cost. Uh, and then you have the research and development for the sound and the build of finding out why things work the best. So that all goes into the price. But there's also a big chunk of the price that's like the status symbol of just having, you know, the best headphone on the planet or the best headphone in the world. You know, there, there's it's certainly, I think, a, a part of that price that gets introduced into that that is just simply to separate so far ahead from other things on uh, the high-end headphone market. There is a couple um, direct competitors. So like uh, Abyss has... Uh, kind of a collaboration with Formula on getting like a really high-end kind of built audio system. And I think that clocks in about like $34,000 for all that equipment. Uh, Heifman has the Shangri-La, which is I think $50,000, which is also an electrostatic, more of a direct competitor actually to the HE1 um, in terms of function and what it's actually built to do and, and all the pieces that are used in it. So there are a couple competitors, but you know, I think Sennheiser is definitely desiring to be on top, especially with the history of the Orpheus, which was built to basically be the same thing that the HE1 is, which is, you know, Sennheiser's take on the best headphone ever. So that is what you're paying for. And from my take, as far as like delivering on that sort of thing, I think it does a fantastic job. I think, you know, if you were to straight up ask, like, does it sound like $60,000? No, uh, not really, like not, you know, the value proposition for something like that is really, really low. But I don't think Sennheiser thinks that way. I don't think I or you think that way. And I don't think that actual legitimate customers of the HU1 think that way either. Uh, so I also want to talk about some of the potential customers that would use this. So I think that there are only two customers. There are customers who are just over the top, a highly, highly dedicated to listening to headphones. Just that top 1% of the top 1% of headphone nerds, basically. And then I think the much larger customer base is the people who see the $60,000 price tag and just don't care. Like it's not really a concern for them. So I think a lot of people in that kind of monetary position, I think are gonna be very happy with a purchase like this. Okay, then I kinda of wanted to talk about music choices here because um, one of the things that I wanted to do was have technical tests to be able to, to kind of have a foundation for the review uh, in terms of you know actually testing proper uh, recordings that would give me an actual idea of what the headphones capable of and then I wanted a, a little bit of stuff that I liked personally so I had to pick a playlist that was um, under you know just around an hour long so I could 
listen for a decent amount of time and also have time to do all the filming and do the review and get set up and tear down within my allotted four hour time slot. Uh, so I, these are the songs I picked and I will explain why I picked them. Uh, again, some of them are more technical, some of them are not technical on purpose, and some of them are just songs that I liked. So uh, I picked um, the main introduction title sequence to Star Wars <laughs> as one of the first songs. Um, there's actually a lot of quality behind that recording, uh, but you get a lot of different instruments. You get all the, the brass, you get all of the strings, and because it's so busy, something that you can test with headphones is how well it separates all that. And I think the HE1 performed very admirably here, and this has some of the strongest separation ability of any headphone that I've heard, and I really like seeing that. I also wanted to test the timbre characteristics. That's one of the things that allows the instruments to separate besides just imaging and soundstage is the timbre characteristics, and of course, they're on point with this headphone. I also did uh, Fluid by Yoshi Hirakawa to more test soundstage and imaging, and also a little bit of bass response and bass impact dynamics, things of that nature. And one of the things that I noticed when doing this test was how specific the bass placement was. And that was a big focus on one of the bass comments that I made in the HE1 review was talking about how the edges of the bass response don't bleed out into kind of a wider field than where the original point source is. And Fluid allows me to kind of tell these specific drops of sounds that have all, you know, full frequency range. I got real low bass and top end frequencies, and you can kind of measure where things are coming from all throughout the range. And that was where the, the bass placement really stood out to me. A lot of headphones, almost all headphones actually, uh, for those songs will have you know, mid-range and treble in one specific place, and then you get kind of this ambiance of bass or this big bloom of it, but not with this. This is very tight, very specifically located, and again, great performance. And then just general imaging placement for this song was great. Uh, a more technical song here was How Deep Is The Ocean from Diana Krall's new album. Uh, that song has got basically everything you would want in a recording. It's got vocals uh, from a female who can sing in a high pitch and low pitches, um, and can kind of get deeper into the mid-range and higher up in the mid-range. It's got a lot of great imaging and sound staging placement for a lot of the background instruments, but it's also not a perfect recording. So there's some errors that you can look for, some errors that you can pick up on, some of the instruments rattle, uh, some of the placements of certain things are not always particularly perfect. Uh, there's a little bit of background uh, noise from like some shuffling, lots of little details and little kind of trinkets of sound that you can pick up on on that song. And it's just a very complete audiophile track, like a lot of Diana Krall's music. Then a song that I just liked, just personally, was The Foggy Dew from The Chieftains and Sinead O'Connor. Uh, and then 747 from Ludwig Gorenson. So this is something that, uh, I'm thinking about making a dedicated video about what this is like, but there's a sense of scale and size to certain headphones that, uh, is not directly imaging and is not directly soundstage width. So you can have a headphone that sounds a lot further out, uh, but it doesn't sound big. And to me, like the HD 800 is like that, where it is, everything's very far out, but not particularly large in scale. Whereas some of the, the bigger Hyphmans, like the Aria, the HE1000 SE, the Edition X, those have scale and height to them of the sound that the 800 doesn't have, but they don't have the width to it. And Ludwig's track here is good for width, it's good for position, but ideally I'd like to see some scale, and I got scale with the HE1. Then the next song was Hallelujah from Pentatonix. Uh, to me, this is the first like clear note of how good the vocal response was on this headphone. That was like the biggest takeaway, it was how like perfect the vocals are on the HE1. Uh, lots of different singers, they have four different singers, all really high level skilled singers, and just the, the timbre and the specificity of the voices, like it could maintain the speed of a voice, but the naturalistic non over sharpenedness of listening to a person face to face, uh, but then all the unique timbre and weird fluctuations, weird, uh, kind of nuances of a human voice. It, it captured all of it, uh, the best I've heard out of a headphone. Uh, then I wanted to play something that was just like, kind of just mainstream music, you know, something that somebody just might 
want to listen to at some point. So I played Blinding Lights from the weekend. Uh, I didn't actually love that on this. Um, this is a headphone that really rewards you for listening to really high quality music. But similar to a lot of high end headphones, you know, the more headroom you give it from the recording, the better the headphone usually does. Uh, another song I just liked was uh, Arrival from Daft Punk. Uh, then a typical audio file recording, which is long after you're gone from Chris Jones, which is going to test male vocals and guitar. And and this is actually a song that a lot of electrostats do really well on on the mid range and the top end, but don't pull off the low end very well. But the HE1 is not your average electrostat, and this pulled off the entire range of this song just flawlessly. It was one of the cleanest, clearest, most enjoyable reproductions of that song that I've heard. And then another song that I liked, which is also a vocal test, which is Sam Smith's Not In That Way. You know, it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> the vocals are amazing. Uh, then Beving for Steven from Yope. Uh, this has got a lot of little crispy crackles in the, the music, a lot of little finite details, deep underlying bass response and great female vocals. And uh, the placement of everything is really nice. The quality of the entire recording is top notch. This is just a, a good high quality test for a high quality headphone. Uh, then you had Strobe from Dead Mouse, which uh, is a song that I both like, but it also provides a unique test um, when the testing is usually based in how the headphone handles resonances of various top end frequencies. So, you know, if a headphone has a resonance issue, this is a good song that's enjoyable to listen to to test that besides just a frequency uh, sweep. So if you hear, you know, the ebb and flow of the music and then all of a sudden there's something that kind of rings and irritates your ear and seems a lot louder than the rest of it, that's a good way of picking that up. I don't know if I'd be able to tell frequency in uh, this specific test uh, because they usually use a combination of frequencies in these noises, but it would have at least highlighted some issue and, you know, no, no major issues for me. Uh, then Space Oddity from Raman uh, Jawadi, and that's from the Westworld soundtrack. This is a take on Space Oddity using string instruments. Uh, it's just really nice to listen to. And then again, we see a return of the very last song in this, which is Mad World, but the Pentatonix version again. That song on that headphone is just baller. It's awesome. It's really good. Uh, okay, so I got to be honest, I'm a little bit insecure about my music choices here because I feel like, I don't know, I feel like there's going to be people who are like, why didn't you listen to this and this and this and stuff like that? And I just wanted to pick music that I was familiar with. I wanted to get a little bit of everything, uh, but so, you know, I can't listen for hours, unfortunately. But I do think that it gave me a very good understanding of what the headphone is really capable of and what its limitations are. And I guess I, I think that'll wrap me up into my conclusion and the, the kind of the, the eventual truth of the HE1. So the HE1 is a fantastic headphone. Uh, the system, the, the sound reproduction capability is phenomenal. Uh, but it's still a, a system, right? It's still a headphone that has its own characteristics. It's still a headphone that has its own flaws. Um, it still has a specific sound signature. Now this is not, and there hasn't ever been a headphone that is going to be just perfect for every listener. Uh, this is not that. This has a specific tuning that I think a lot of people are really gonna like. I think it's a very safe, very enjoyable tuning. Okay, so my general recommendation for this headphone and any headphone, regardless of interest and price, is to see if you can try it before you buy it. You know, see if you can set up some sort of private listening session, get an understanding of what the headphone is great for and what it's just okay for and what it's not great for. Yeah, I think that's gonna wrap it up, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Um, this is a lot of fun. Uh, again, this video is probably gonna be a little bit longer because I wanted to talk about a bunch of different stuff, but I appreciate you sticking with me here. I'd love to know your thoughts. If you've heard this headphone, what you thought in the comment section down below. And until the next video, uh, my name is Josh. And I'll see you next time.